Hi, and welcome to this edition of the Dental Talk Show. Help, I need somebody. Help, not just anybody. Help, you know I need someone. Help. Hello, uh, I'm Ray Goodman. I'm uh, Joint Managing Director of Goodman Grant Solicitors, uh, along with my colleague John Grant here. Uh, we're specialist uh, dental solicitors uh, and we deal um, almost exclusively with dental practice matters. This morning we, we wanted to talk to you about uh, incorporation, specifically the uh, NHS uh, guidance policy for incorporation. Just very briefly, April of last year, NHS England uh, issued its first guidance uh, policy guidance. Uh, before, for that, before that, it was a free-for-all and your ability to incorporate depended on uh, what the uh, contract manager at your PCT thought of you. Uh, the NHS, in its infinite wisdom, then brought out guidance last April, uh, as a result of which it actually became far easier for NHS practices to incorporate. And they've now brought out this, which is the new policy uh, guidance policy for incorporation of primary dental contracts and that contains one or two nasty surprises. We're, we're very much now under the terms of this new guidance back in the position where uh, it is going to be entirely down to each LAT as to how they choose to uh, interpret uh, and implement uh, the guidance. Uh, unfortunately it is uh, sadly lacking in terms of clarity in a number of very important areas. When you actually get into the into the background, and actually it's an interesting is that because it's headed background, um, and then the pro the paragraphs which follow is actually nothing to do with the background. Um, but paragraph one is certainly uh, one of the paragraphs which uh, caused me to sit up and have real concern about whether actually NHS practices are going to be able to incorporate going forward. And what paragraph one says is, um, it is the principle of NHS England that the area team does not need to agree, so it can but it does not need to agree, uh, an incorporation request unless it can show a clear benefit to the patients of and for the area team. Um, I mean, the, 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 language, you know, the, the English there is absolutely appalling, um, and we don't know whether the it refers to the person who's applying to incorporate, or to the LAT, or to the actual application uh, to incorporate itself, uh, but if we assume that it's uh, the LAT, then this means that the LAT has to be able to demonstrate a benefit for itself to the incorporation. In the, it, this document now incorporates uh, everything that was in the last guidance, but it adds some very pertinent additional requirements. One is that there has to be a benefit to the patients, a demonstrable uh, benefit to the patients and uh, for the area team. And secondly, that the NHS England can add additional uh, provisions to the contract. It, it will look at the value for money uh, that it's getting from the contract and can propose adjustments to the UDA value um, if it considers that there are to be uh, the, the, the changes that will be uh, in, uh, incorporated in the in the contract on incorporation will constitute a material change it can then decide that the contract can't be novated it would have to go out to tender the only changes that will be affected to the contract are those that will be dictated by the local area team. So you've got a crazy situation where on an application for tender, the local area team can decide to vary the contract, and if it then decides that those variations are material, it can then decide that the incorporation can't go ahead and that the, that the uh, contract has to go out to tender. So it can really engineer a situation, if it wants, that would make incorporation totally impractical for the applicant. But I think we should just look at um, paragraph 11 of, of the guidance. Um, is there an opportunity for tender? Um, taking into account, one, the value of the contract, two, the level of market interest, three, potential for innovation, four, the need to protect services in the core contract, and five, continu continuity of patient care. So the implication there is that they are actively seeking opportunities to go out to tender, which again must... Uh, ring alarm bells with, with everybody who is contemplating incorporating the practice. 
Secondly, they have to they look at the current contract price. Is the current UDA rate good value for money? This can be determined using the area team adjusted average rate as a benchmark. Now that smacks of a similar scenario as we have with applications to convert from PDS to GDS contracts. We're following uh, a decision by the NHS Litigation Authority. That's the people. That's the um, uh, we may now well be seeing that LAT is flexing their muscles and saying, well, OK, we will allow you to incorporate, but only on condition that we reduce your, your UDA rate from the existing rate to the average for the area, which may, you know, which may be uh, a significant disincentive. Because actually, one thing that occurs to me, even as you were speaking, is that what you could do in order to demonstrate um, a benefit to the LAT and to patients who uh, uh, obviously pay for the NHS through their taxes, is you could actually propose a reduction in the UDA rate. Then, as you say, you, you've got to then work out the calculations and figure out what's really, you know, the effect on the goodwill value of your practice, because not that you're allowed to sell your practice, um, uh, the, what the annual income would, would be reduced by, and compare that to the tax saving. But it may be that by proposing that, that would be a benefit, and that could be a way of actually getting the applications incorporated. Yeah, through. that could well be a strategy. Another strategy could be to, to offer uh, increased access um, increased hours, some sort of bone to the LAT for them to be able to justify to themselves that this isn't a major uh, alteration to the contract that would require them to go out to tender. What it specifically says um, with regard to CQC, which again is, is potentially a cause for concern, um, it says that the applications will not be considered um, so you don't even get to the stage of them thinking about whether there's a benefit or not. Uh, applications will not be considered where, um, and again forgive the English, uh, it has outstanding issues regarding CQC, presumably it should have said the practice, has outstanding issues regarding CQC inspection or area team practice inspection. Now, a lot of practices, when they've been inspected by CQC, had issues. There were very, very few practices which were perfect. Um, and if you go on the CQC website, you can see them. And if you delve down, you can find that a lot of these issues were very, very minor. Um, but again, if that clause is interpreted literally, then if you have any outstanding issues with CQC, however minor, however trivial, then the LAT, under this guidance, will not consider your application. So again, to me, that's another opportunity if you, uh, if, you know, for the LAT, uh, if it doesn't like incorporations, to, to refuse them. Thank you to Ray Goodman and John Grant there from Goodman Grant Dental Solicitors. You can check them out through their website, goodmangrant.co.uk, or you can add your questions down below and I'll put it to them in the next episode. So thank you very much for watching the Dental Talk Show. You can follow me on Twitter at Dental Talk Show. Check out previous episodes of my Dental Talk Show on my website, dentaltalkshow.com. And thanks very much for watching and I'll catch you next time.